All right. So what we're going to be going over today, guys, we're going to start looking at essentially the simplest part of the chemistry unit, which is the atom. All right. What's essentially all matter is made up of. We have to look at its structure, okay, its parts. We got to look at how it works, okay, because that's the basis of basically everything else that we're going to talk about in this unit. Why compounds form, uh, why certain compounds do certain things while others don't, okay, all those kind of things are the result of how the atom of each and every different element works, okay. Uh, so that's what kind of the, the basis for the rest of the unit. And basically, all the units start out that way. We start out with Let's look at the simplest part and build from there. Okay, so the key points for today, we need to understand how the theories of the structure of the atom were developed. Okay, our idea of what the atom looked like has changed radically over the last few hundred years. Okay, because obviously our technology got better, we we're able to do different kinds of experiments, and as a result, found out new things about its behavior and structure. Okay. And we need to learn the parts of the atom and their characteristics. That should be a review. The atom is essentially made up of three major parts. What are they? Anybody remember from Science 9? Neutrons is one of them. Okay, what else? Protons. And... Electrons. You could have probably flipped forward in the notes package and found all of those, but good. Okay. Um, so those are essentially the three major parts of the atom we now know, and you'll take in physics 30 when you do atomic structure there, that neutrons, protons, and electrons are actually made up of even smaller things okay, called quarks. And there's all kinds of different quarks, up quarks, down quarks, strange quarks. There's all kinds of quarks. Okay. But don't learn about that till physics 30, so I don't have to worry about it yet. <coughs> so um, essentially, all of these particles interact in every single atom, okay, to give it its essentially its characteristics. Okay. All right. Questions so far. All right. The birth of chemistry comes from something we call alchemy. Okay. Alchemists were people who weren't really scientists. Okay. They were people who um, we're trying to get rich, really. Okay? That was kind of their goal. They wanted to find ways to convert things that were not all that valuable into things that were valuable. Okay? They wanted to transmute things like lead into silver and gold, which were very valuable. Uh, they wanted to be able to uh, create the elixir of life, okay? some drink that people could could take and they would live forever. All right, things like that. That's what they were after. Obviously, things like that are impossible. Okay, we know that now. But along the way, all of their experiments did produce some useful information that was then used okay, later on to develop ideas about the atom and matter and things like that. Okay? Now, being an al alchemist wasn't all trial and error, mixing chemicals. Sometimes it was blowing yourself up. A few of them did that. I'm sure gunpowder was invented many times. Someone just had to live long enough to write it down on paper. Okay? Now, the Chinese are given credit for that. Okay? The Chinese are the ones who invented or discovered gunpowder first. Okay? Um, and obviously, that was kind of a big, big deal. Okay? Because it's very explosive and highly useful as well as destructive. Okay? Um, the other kinds of reactions that they were you know, using were things like uh, ways to dye cloth, tan leather, and prepare, and not just prepare, but also preserve foods. Okay? We add things to foods now so that they don't spoil very quickly. All right? We call those what? What do you add? Someone said it? Preservatives. Right. Okay? We add preservatives. They're not necessarily all that good for us, as we found out later, but <coughs> they do keep food uh, from spoiling because okay? they prevent the growth of bacteria and mold and things like that. Okay? And, and these are the types of things that these people were discovering along the way, trying to you know, get rich doing other things. All right, so the earliest atomist, okay, the first person to come up with this idea that all matter was made up of these tiny little particles was a guy named Democritus, okay? Probably not much of a surprise, he was Greek, okay? The Greeks were the thinkers, okay? That was actually Democritus's job, okay? The job of being a thinker, that was the best gig to have in ancient Greece, Okay, Plato was a thinker, all right, guys like that. Okay, they were all very, very important. Aristotle was a thinker. And basically you got to sit around and eat grapes. People would feed you grapes and fan you with a big palm branch. Okay, and you got to chill out all day and come up with good ideas. 
All right. Now, um, the problem for Democritus, he was right. Everything was made up of these tiny indivisible particles called atoms. But no one bought it because they can't see them. Okay? They said, you're, you're telling me that matter is made up of these tiny little balls that I can't see. That didn't make any sense. Okay? Think up something else. Right. Which he did. What did he think up? It's kind of like his name. Democracy. It wasn't all bad for Democritus. Okay? He did come up with something good. Okay? Uh, it's just his idea of the atom was rejected. Okay? And the reason for that is better thinkers, or not so much better thinkers, but more respected thinkers like Aristotle had better explanations. And they said that all matter is made up of four elements. Earth, air, fire, and water. And these things made sense to people of the time because they were things that they could see. Okay? They had essentially a periodic table of all the matter that existed that they knew of that told them how much of everything was water, air, fire, etc. Okay? So if you were looking at, let's say, lava flowing down the mountain. Well, lava was some parts water and some parts earth and some parts fire. Okay? Why? Because it flowed like water, it came out of the earth, and it was hot. So, it made sense that it was some parts of each of the three. Everyone follow me there? Okay. Steam was obviously some parts fire, some parts air, and some parts water. Because okay. they know you can't make steam without water, but you have to add fire to it in order to get it, and then it goes and floats up into the air. So it sort of made sense. These were things that they could explain to themselves, and obviously the most reasonable explanation must be the right one. Okay. It wasn't, but it made the most sense and people accepted it. Everyone kind of follow me there? And that's how scientific ideas come along. We find something that's a good explanation, and we keep it until something better comes along. All right. So anyway, people forgot about Aristotle, or sorry, uh, Democritus's idea of the atom here for like 2,000 years. Okay? So he never got to enjoy the sweet revenge of being right, but okay, he was in the end. Okay. So during the Middle Ages, okay, chemistry reappeared okay, because of the alchemists whose goal, obviously, like we said, was to change common substances into gold. They were never successful because in order to do that, you would actually have to change the atoms of whatever it is you're dealing with into a different kind of atom, which is impossible. Okay? In order to change something into something else, you have to actually have to physically alter its atomic structure. And since atoms are very small, you can't just go in there with a pair of tweezers and start pulling protons and electrons off and turn it into something else. It just doesn't work that way. Okay? So it is impossible to turn one thing into something else by the ways that they were doing it, which was essentially mixing things together. So why did they think that that would work? They kept trying it. Why did they think it would work? If you mix vinegar and baking soda together, what happens? It bubbles and fizzes, right? And your end products are much different than what you started with, right? You get a gas. You didn't start with anything as a gas, but you get a gas as a result. So when they mixed things together and saw that they could produce new stuff, they didn't realize they weren't turning this into that. They were just rearranging the atoms. They didn't realize that. They thought they were actually turning something into something else. Right? So they just kept going with it. They figured there's got to be a way. I turned, let's say they add you know, acid to, uh, let's say, a metal like zinc. It'll essentially dissolve the metal and turn it into a gas and then a little solution. Okay? And they would say, look at that. I turned that piece of metal into a gas. I made it disappear. I'm magic. Right? And so they figured there had to be a way to do it. It was logical to assume that because they didn't know anything about the atom and how it worked. All right? Okay, so along the way with all these experiments, they did come up with some useful information. Okay, later on, a couple of guys kind of brought together all of this information that the alchemists had discovered, which was a difficult task because alchemists were very secretive. They didn't want to share their information with anyone else for fear that they might find something in their information that could get them rich. Okay? So they kind of hoarded all their information away and didn't let anyone see it. Um, so over the course of many years, these two guys kind of compiled all this information and, and were able to turn alchemy into a more respectable science by inventing the scientific method. Okay? And the scientific method involves investigating a problem by having a hypothesis. Okay? You come up with a hypothesis that says, here's why 
here's the solution to this problem, okay? Or here's why this thing is happening. And then an experiment to test it, right? And then using the data from the experiment, okay, decide whether or not you were right in your hypothesis as to what was the solution to the problem, right? Using that process and then obviously sharing information, which was the part that wasn't happening before, really led to the science of chemistry kind of taking off, okay? So these two guys, Lavoisier and Bacon, are probably the two most important guys in terms of coming up with the scientific method. All right, if I take, let's say, a cube of any element, we'll say lead because it's the example in the notes here, and I start cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces, do all the pieces still have the same properties? Yeah, because it's still lead. It's just smaller and smaller pieces of lead. Okay, All those pieces have the same melting point. They have the same boiling point. They have the same density, Okay, the same electrical conductivity, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I haven't changed the lead by changing the shape or the size of the pieces. Okay, and that's true all the way down. If I could actually cut that lead all the way down to single atoms, it would still be true of a single atom. Okay, a single atom of lead has all the same properties as a big chunk of it. All right, because they're all made up of exactly identical atoms. Every atom of lead is indistinguishable from any other. Okay? They have the same number of protons, they have the same number of neutrons, they have the same number of electrons. Well, the neutrons part, there's isotopes, but we'll say essentially they're all the same. Okay? Because of that, they have the same properties. It is the number of protons in an atom that determines the properties. I want to write that down. It's the number of protons in an atom that determines the properties of it. Okay, and the reason we say that is you cannot change the number of protons in an atom. Okay. The number of electrons can change. When atoms react with each other, form compounds, the distribution of electrons changes. So an atom might lose some, it might gain some, it might share some with somebody else, okay? But the number of protons never changes. So the properties are determined by the number of protons, okay? Number of neutrons, most of the time, all the atoms have the same number of neutrons, but there are things called isotopes, which may have different numbers, but they're very small in very small amounts, okay? So we essentially say that they're all the same. All right, uh, so the atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. If I could just keep cutting and I cut that atom in half, then what would happen? Okay, so if I could keep cutting and I actually cut an atom in half, okay, now what would happen to it? Would the two pieces now have less protons than before? What do you think? Well, if I cut one atom in half, now I have two atoms and they have to have less protons than before, agreed? Now I would have two new materials, okay? What would also probably happen if I did that? Yeah, kaboom, okay? That's what nuclear fission is, splitting the atom, okay? Atoms are very tightly held together by inter... In, by atomic forces, they're essentially electromagnetic, right? You've got protons and electrons which are opposite and they attract each other and they hold on to each other. So the atom is very stable, okay? If you break it up, then the energy that was holding it together gets released. Yeah. Now, if you were to split one single atom, okay, you're not getting a giant mushroom cloud destroying cities and things like that. One atom is so incredibly small, you'd never notice it even if you could, all right? But you can't cut an atom with a knife. Thankfully, because th that would be bad, okay? We'd be cutting them all the time when we prepared food. So, okay, you, if you ever look at a knife under a microscope, a knife is, like, under a microscope doesn't even look sharp, right? It's millions of atoms across on the sharp edge. You could never cut one atom with something that's a million atoms across. Agreed? 
right? It would be like trying to, let's say, um, well, let's say cut a pea with a hammer, right? You could smash the pea, but you're not going to cut it with the hammer. It's just not going to work, right? All right, so we've got this kind of idea going here where, okay, the atom is the smallest unit. Now, if I want to split the atom, okay, how do I do that? Can't cut it physically. How do you split an atom? Actually, they don't use lasers because lasers will just burn them. Okay, lasers are actually uh, just a, kind of a heat beam. Okay, what they do is okay. So in a in a nuclear power plant, there are things called fuel rods. Okay, which they're just like they sound. They're a big metal rod, and embedded on them are chunks of uranium, like 238. Okay, which is the nuclear fuel that we use. They lower these rods into water and then shoot particles at them, okay? They shoot neutrons and stuff at them, okay? Now, the, an atom of uranium is really, really big, right? Um, to give you some idea here, okay? Uranium's here on the periodic table, okay? It, its atoms have 92 protons in them, okay? Which is really, really big, okay? It has a mass of 238 grams per mole, all right? So really heavy. It's got lots of neutrons in it. Lots and lots of neutrons. Okay, um, so it's really, really heavy. It's really, really big. The bigger an atom gets, the harder it is for it to stay together, which is why uranium is radioactive. It actually splits and breaks down on its own slowly. Okay. Is everyone following me so far? So if I shoot a smaller atom at it, okay, I can break it, and when it breaks, it releases the energy that was holding it together. But it becomes a chain reaction. When one atom breaks, the pieces of it go off and break other atoms. And then, okay, if you let it, that can get out of control. And that's when you get kaboom, the big mushroom cloud and all that. Okay, obviously you don't want that in a nuclear reactor. So the amount of fuel that gets exposed at one time is much smaller. Everybody with me there? Okay, if it starts to get too hot or they need to generate less electricity, they just pull more of the rod out of the path so less nuclear fission goes on. Now. In a nuclear bomb, I'm going to tell you how to make a nuclear bomb. It's okay for me to tell you that because you'll never get your hands on the stuff you need to do it. Okay. Hopefully no ISIS people are watching. Okay. In a nuclear bomb, you have a big container, okay, made out of high explosive. TNT, okay, uh, C4, something like that. Okay, and inside you have a big chunk of fissionable material, okay? That would be plutonium, uranium, okay, whatever it is you want to go boom, okay? You put that inside. Now, the, way, the reason you shape your container like this is you want all of the explosion to be focused onto this, all right? So when it explodes, a whole bunch of particles go flying in at this big chunk of nuclear material. And as pieces of it break and atoms of it break, those pieces go off and break other atoms, and you get a chain reaction that just gets out of control, and then you get a big nuclear detonation. Okay? It's, it's a little bit more complex than that, but essentially, that's how you do it. All right? Scared yet? It's really hard to get your hands on nuclear material. Okay? That's, that's a good thing. All right, so that's kind of how it works. But the idea here is that when you have the splitting of the atom, the stuff you have after is different. Okay? You no longer have uranium after you've split it. Okay? You have radioactive forms of lead after because you've altered the atoms. You've broken them down into smaller, more stable atoms okay? that are now obviously different. Okay? Now, that obviously doesn't happen very much in nature, okay? thankfully. It okay? happens very, very slowly, okay? but it doesn't happen very much. Everyone good with that? Okay. What's the other kind of nuclear energy? There's fission and there's... Sounds kind of like it. Fusion, right. Okay, fission and fusion. Fission is splitting an atom. Okay, fusion is combining them, right? And fusion is what powers the sun, right? So um, at an atomic level, what fusion looks like is this. I have a hydrogen atom, which is one proton and one electron. Okay, and I have another hydrogen atom over here that's 
Okay, one proton, one electron, and I have another hydrogen atom over here. Okay, that's one proton and one electron. Under an incredible gravitational force, these three atoms get crushed together. Okay, in the process of getting crushed together, their nuclei, which is essentially just a proton, fuse and become one. In that fusion process, one of the atoms turns into a neutron. Okay? The electron and the proton get so forced together that they actually become one particle. The negative and the positive cancel each other out, okay? and you get a neutron. And you get what, after that, you get a helium nucleus, which is a proton, a proton, a neutron, and two electrons. In the process of altering those three atoms, incredible amounts of energy are released. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there you go. That's all. Okay. That's all energy, but it all has to do with altering the structure of an atom. Okay. So obviously, the structure of an atom is pretty stable, and in nature, most of the time, you don't have that kind of stuff going on. Okay. This obviously is what powers the sun. It's going on all the time, but the sun is kind of exceptional in that it's really, really big and has lots of gravity. All right. I don't know why I have all that done already. Hang on here, guys. I'm just going to erase that real quick. All right. 1700s, late 1700s, okay, after Lavoisier and Bacon have, you know, got the scientific method going and people are doing experiments, okay, a guy named John Dalton noticed that during chemical reactions, when he mixed things together, certain things were happening, certain patterns, okay, always appeared. So based on those patterns, he resurrected Democritus's idea that all matter is made of tiny particles, because it was the only idea that could explain what was going on. Okay, so he came up with the atomic theory. I would say the four points of the atomic theory are something you should most definitely know. Highlight, star, or something, okay, in your notes, these four points. Okay, not only are they an easy multiple choice question, okay, since there are four of them, I could do something like which of the following is not part of the atomic theory, okay? Um, but they could also be part of an answer where you'd be explaining why something happens. You could refer back to this and say, well, you know, the atomic theory says that in a reaction, this is what's going on, so maybe that's why, you know, this thing occurs in nature or something like that, okay? So the first thing was, all elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. Not invisible, indivisible, which means you can't break them, you can't split them. All right, which is essentially true. Okay? In nature, you do not split atoms. All right? Under high technology kind of situations, yes, you can. All right? his, his idea here in saying they're indivisible is if you do split them, they're not the same after. Okay, everyone okay with that? All right, so that's essentially what he's saying there. Okay, point number two, atoms of the same element are identical. Okay? This explained why any two chunks of iron are exactly the same. Okay, because every atom of iron is exactly the same. Okay? The atoms of any one element are different from those of any other element, which is why if you put iron and lead beside each other, there are obvious differences. They're made up of different kinds of atoms. Okay, three and four explain the behavior of materials when they react with each other. Okay? So in that way, they're probably the most important parts of his atomic theory. Atoms of different elements can combine with one another in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. That is the key. Whole number ratios. You never have half an atom or three quarters of an atom reacting with something. Because if you did, it wouldn't be that material anymore. Because it would be missing stuff. All right? So what I mean by that is this. Okay? If I combine hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, I can get this stuff. Okay. How many atoms of hydrogen are here? Two. How many atoms of oxygen are here? Two. How many atoms of hydrogen here? How many atoms of oxygen? One. Okay, there's a bit of a problem. All right. We can fix that. 
Now there's four atoms of hydrogen, four atoms of hydrogen, okay? Two atoms of oxygen, two atoms of oxygen. Everyone okay with what I did there? Okay, now there's the same amount on both sides, right? Are there any halves here? Right? There's no half an atom, there's no three quarters of an atom or anything like that, right? Every time something goes together, it's in whole numbers. Two atoms to one atom. Okay, same would go if I had, let's say, something like, let's say a little bit more complex. Okay, are we still looking at whole numbers here? Okay, every atom of magnesium needs two atoms of chlorine. It doesn't need one and a half atoms of chlorine, it needs two. Okay, and over here, every atom of hydrogen needs one atom of chlorine to go with it. There's never going to be any halves. Okay, you can't have half an atom. All right, that's what point number three is talking about. And in number four, okay, number four kind of backs up the idea that Matter is made of tiny particles. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated from each other, not one atom pulled apart, but two atoms that were together are separated, okay, joined or rearranged. So in this first reaction, okay, what are we doing with these two atoms? Separating, joining, or rearranging. I'm having two different things going to one, so I would be joining. Yeah, okay, I'm joining these two, but these ones I'm rearranging. Okay, so he's saying in a chemical reaction, you, you're not making anything new. You're just changing what you have. All right, this, is, this point number four was the death blow to alchemy. Okay, their whole idea of being able to turn lead into gold was defeated by this one discovery. You cannot change this into that. All you can do is rearrange what you have. Okay? So that's what point number four is saying. You cannot transmute one thing into another. All you can do is rearrange what you had before because the atoms themselves can't change. All right? On both sides of this equation here, I have hydrogen and oxygen. Agreed? The way they're arranged is different, but I still have the same stuff. I didn't magically come up with carbon somehow. Okay, and it's the same down here. I had hydrogen and chlorine and magnesium. On this side, I have magnesium, chlorine, and hydrogen. I didn't make anything new. I just rearranged what I had. Okay. We're going to write with that. Okay. Now, for Dalton, he was dealing with stuff at what we would call a macro level. Macro is big. Micro is small. Okay, he was dealing with things on a macro level. He he wasn't dealing doing atomic physics. Okay, he was mixing stuff together and finding that he always got ratios of what he had at the beginning, right? Which meant that there had to be units to the matter. Okay, and he decided those units are going to be called atoms, which was Greek, okay, for indivisible. Right, it made sense because that's what he was dealing with. Okay, and he said, well, the most common shape that he saw in nature was the sphere. Stars were spheres, planets were spheres. It made sense that atoms should be spheres. So we said, atoms are these tiny little balls. Okay, we can't see them, but that's what the atom looks like. It's a tiny little ball. It was okay for the time, as we didn't know that atoms had other parts. Okay, that would take kind of further research. So the solid sphere idea, okay, was Dalton. So Dalton believed in the solid sphere model. Okay, which simply said, the, the atom is a tiny little ball. Yeah. Almost a hundred years later, okay, a guy named J.J. Thompson is doing some reactions with what we call now electrochemistry. The reactions he was causing could produce electric currents. Okay? These are the reactions we now use in batteries. Okay? These were the reactions he was dealing with. And he said, something is wrong with Dalton's solid sphere model. If every atom is a solid sphere, 
then how can I produce an electric current by reacting these little balls together? Okay? There's nothing that should make electric current. Okay? Electricity has to be caused by particles, and I don't have any less particles when I'm done this reaction. I still have the same amount of everything when I'm finished as when I started. He said, so there's got to be some small part of an atom that has an electrical charge. So he modified Dalton's model, because Dalton's model couldn't explain what he was doing. So he said, Dalton's model must be wrong. Okay? If Dalton's model can't explain what I'm doing, Dalton's model needs to change. So he said, the atom is this solid kind of lump, okay? but embedded on its surface are these little particles that are electrical and are negatively charged. Since they were electrical, he called them electrons. Okay? So J.J. Thompson essentially discovered electrons by doing this electrochemistry kind of experiment. Okay, so the model of the atom changed from the solid sphere to what he called plum pudding. Because apparently it looks like pudding with plums in it, I guess. Okay, that's kind of what he said it was. They're embedded on the surface, but they're only loosely embedded on the surface. That way they could explain that when they reacted and maybe they ran into each other, electrons would fall off. And then that's where the electric current came from. Okay? He said, electrons must be very, very small because I never notice any change in mass when they go away. Okay? So it sort of made sense. Okay? And people accepted it for quite a long time. All right, so you got Thompson's model, plum pudding. Probably better put those two guys okay, together. Thompson okay, with the plum pudding model. Because oftentimes, guys, on the unit exam, what I'll do is just put a picture on there and say, whose model is that? Okay, something like that. Now, as soon as he said there's these negative charges embedded on the surface, people said, then how come all matter isn't negatively charged? I mean, it's a valid argument, right? If he said all these negative charges are there, okay, then all matter should be negative. So his answer to that was, well, the big thing that they're stuck in, that solid sphere that Dalton talked about, that's the positive part. So there's this big positive chunk, and then there's these little negatives, and they all balance out. Okay? Now, people accepted that, but n not, let's say, willingly. All right? Then a lot, of, a lot more experiments came from that, kind of trying to develop, okay, maybe there's something other than this big chunk. Unfortunately for Thompson, his model didn't last long. Okay, 1897, by the early 20s, let's say, people were starting to find holes in it. Okay, shortly thereafter, protons were discovered. Okay, and this was due to the fact that all chemists agreed that atoms had to be electrically neutral. Okay, uh, so there was a small negative, if there was a small negatively charged particle, there had to be a positively charged particle as well. So if the negative ones are electrons, the positive ones are going to be protons. For a while, they toyed with positron, but that's different. Okay, uh, so it's protons and electrons. Okay, now they also said that the proton has got to be larger than the electron. Reason for that is again back to Thompson's experiments, where when the electric current was produced, the mass of his stuff didn't change, which means electrons could flow, but they didn't have very much mass because we couldn't measure that we couldn't measure any difference. Does that sort of make sense? So they said all the positive stuff that's in an atom is where most of the mass is. Okay. People accepted that for a short while. And then they started to do some calculating. And they realized that protons had to be incredibly heavy. And that they that must not be right. There's no way that something really, really small could attract something really, really big, even if they were, you know, oppositely charged. So they said there's got to be something else in the atom that helps to make up that extra mass. What would it be? Neutrons, right? You can't have a charge because we've already accounted for the positive and negative balancing each other out. So there's got to be some other thing in there that's neutral. Okay? So that's where the idea of neutrons came from. And that kind of led to this discovery of isotopes and then, you know, uh, a lot of the kind of radiometric kind of dating, like. Um, if you've ever heard of carbon dating, some people have heard of that term before. They use it to figure out how old stuff is. Okay, um, they do that with things other than carbon, but 
Um, the idea that some things could give off particles meant that there had to be a particle they could give off without losing charge, okay, but with losing a little bit of mass. That's kind of the idea for the neutron. Okay, so the neutron carries no charge and it's neutral. Now, people are all in agreement. Okay, the, the atom is made up of three parts. Now, what does the atom look like? Okay, this is now where, where science was headed. We need a model. Okay, we agree that it's got this in it. We agree it's got that in it. Plum pudding doesn't work anymore. Okay, it didn't account for protons and neutrons, so it's out. We got to have something that we can look at, some visual representation of what the atom looks like. So lots of experiments went on to try and figure this out. Okay, obviously atoms are too small to just put them under a microscope and check them out. Okay, so they had to come up with experiments that could prove what they looked like. Okay, Ernest Rutherford's the guy that essentially proved what the atom, for the most part, looks like. Okay, his idea was that electrons were these little particles that freely circled the central mass. Okay, but he said the central mass is really, really big. Okay, his, he said if it's really, really small, the electrons would have to be really far away, and it just didn't work. It's kind of hard to explain, but it just didn't really work for how matter behaves, okay? Things wouldn't be solid and, yeah, it'd be weird, okay? So it just didn't work with how the universe works. Uh, so he said, it, it's got to be, you know, kind of big and, and the, you know, the electrons have to orbit it and they orbit it because they're attracted to it, because they're, they're opposites and, and he kind of had this idea and people are like, well, you know, the plum pudding model really explains the mass better, not really sure about your idea. So Rutherford said, okay, fine, I'm going to prove that there's some space not very much, but some, between the electrons and, and the rest of the atom, and between atoms themselves. Because okay? people had this idea that atoms fit like right together, and there was no space in between them. They said, if there's space in between atoms, then I should just be able to pass my hand through this table. Okay? That was kind of their reasoning. They said, atoms have to be really, really close together. They can't have any empty space, otherwise solids wouldn't be solid. So Rutherford said, I don't think that's right. I think there is space. So he came up with an experiment. Okay, and his experiment looks like this. Okay. He had a source of alpha particles, essentially like an X-ray machine. Okay, and he was shooting them at a piece of gold foil. So like tin foil, but made out of gold. I don't know why he chose to use expensive stuff, but that's what he did. Okay, so he had this piece of gold foil, and all around it, he had a screen that was essentially made out of photographic film. Now I know you guys have probably never used a camera that had film in it, but cameras used to have this stuff called film in them. Okay? And when you would expose the film to light, it would change color. All right? So his idea was that when these x-rays would hit the film, you'd get little white spots all over, which is what happens. How many people have had an x-ray before? Okay, so what happens when you stand in front of the x-ray machine is you stand here, okay, the x-rays go through you, and on this side of you is a piece of film, okay, and, um, sorry, is behind you is a piece of film. Some of the x-rays go right through you, right, but the thicker parts of you, like your bones, reflect the x-rays back, and those reflected x-rays go back, and they touch the film, and they expose it, and you get a picture of all the hard parts of your body, okay, so that's kind of what he was doing here with the gold foil. Now, people looked at this experiment and went, what are you even bothering? You know that they're just going to bounce off of that. The foil is solid. Except they didn't. Okay? When he ran this experiment, almost all of the x-rays went through the foil. Okay? Now, metals should reflect stuff. They're solid. Okay? But this stuff didn't. It went right through it. Now, he also found that some of the particles didn't go straight through. Some of them got deflected a little bit. So his explanation for, how that, for the reason that that happened was this. The atom is mostly empty space. The electrons are tiny. The nucleus is much bigger, but still also very, very small. He said this was, <clears throat> this was the experiment that proved that all atoms had a nucleus. He said, yes, the nucleus is very small, which is why many of the particles, which are these arrows here, went straight through and never got deflected. But some of them hit that nucleus 
and it deflected them this way, which is why he got some dots that are kind of off to the sides. Okay, and some, yep, some would have hit him pretty much straight on and came almost straight back. Okay, everybody with me there? Okay, so hit this experiment was probably the most important experiment in terms of the nuclear model of the atom. Okay, it proved solid sphere was wrong. If solid sphere was right, all of the all of the stuff he shot at it should have come straight back. Okay, but most of it went through. Okay, which proved the atom is actually mostly empty space. All right, it's just that atoms are very very small. All right, the empty space. Sure, there's lots of empty space, but that empty space is still too small for us to go passing our finger through a solid material. Okay. All right. Now, later on, a guy named Niels Bohr came along, okay, and because now that they decided the model of the atom involves a nucleus with electrons around it, now the argument was, what do the electrons look like? Okay, do they orbit like planets around the sun? Do they orbit randomly? Do they move up and down? What do they do? Okay, so that was kind of the next big argument. It was, okay, we decided on one thing, now we got other problems. No one can ever be happy, okay, we have to decide what's next. All right, so Bohr decided that you know, we see planets orbiting the sun. Electrons should do that. Electrons should orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun in circles. Okay? He had some reasoning behind that that was sort of, sort of, uh, you know, solid evidence. Okay? Um, but in the end, we've discovered that Bohr is partly right. If I was to take a picture of an atom, it would look like Bohr's model. Okay? Electrons would be frozen in time at certain positions from the nucleus. Okay, but if I was to take a, a video of an atom, it would look more like this. That the electrons move in a cloud, and that they're not a fixed distance away from the nucleus all the time. Right? They can move closer to the nucleus, and they can move farther away from the nucleus based on how much energy the atom has. Right? How many of you have a watch where the numbers... Like if you've been in the light and then you go in the dark, you can still see the numbers. Okay? Glow in the dark materials. You guys have seen that, right? Right. Now, the way those work is because of this electron cloud model. When the electrons of that material, that glow in the dark material, get excited by light, because light's a form of energy, they move faster. And when they move faster, they move further away from the nucleus. When you go in the dark, you take away the energy that was making them move faster, so they slow down. And when they slow down and fall back towards the nucleus, they give that energy back. So they glow for a little while until they've lost the energy they gained and then they don't glow anymore. All right? So it was kind of that idea okay, that led a guy named de Broglie to this model, which we call the electron cloud. Okay? The electron cloud, or the quantum model as it's sometimes called, is our currently accepted model of the atom. Okay. Now, this idea of electrons being able to move up and down is also the explanation for how photosynthesis works. Okay. Plants actually use this nature of the atom. Okay. In chlorophyll, when sun strikes the chlorophyll molecule in the leaves of the plants, the electrons on the chlorophyll move faster, and they move further away from the atom, or from the nucleus, sorry. Okay. And then, when the light is gone, so at night, those electrons start moving back. And when they do, they release the energy. They don't glow, obviously. Plants don't glow in the dark. Okay? But they, the energy that they release is then used to make sugar. Okay? It's used to break up carbon dioxide and water and reassemble them into sugar. Right? So it's a, a pretty good source of energy. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, so we've talked about now the solid sphere, which was Dalton's idea. Okay, we've talked about the plum pudding, which was Thompson's idea. All right, we've talked about the Rutherford experiment. Okay, his model. Okay, Rutherford's model looked like this. Okay, his idea was there's a nucleus and the electrons kind of are evenly spaced, orbiting around. Okay, at fixed distances, but you can see he thought the electrons were quite close. Okay, to the nucleus. All right. We got Bohr's model, 
okay, which is essentially like planets orbiting the sun, and then we've got de Broglie's electron cloud. Okay, so you really only have to remember not it's not too many models. All right, so the structure of the atom as we currently understand it is there's a dense, positively charged nucleus, okay, right here, and there are very, very tiny, negatively charged electrons, okay, floating around the outside. Right, so the atom is really made up of a lot of empty space. Now, we talked about this here as well earlier, okay, we talked about how atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms of one element are different from another because each element has a different number of protons. Okay, how many people have used periodic table before? All right, good, so this will be kind of review for you. Okay, this number here that appears in the top of every periodic table, okay, is the atomic number. It tells us the number of protons in the nucleus of that atom. And you can see that for every single element, the number is different. Okay, there are no two elements that essentially share okay, the same atomic number. Okay, so in a, in a lithium atom, there's how many protons? Three, okay, whereas in a beryllium atom, there's four, right? Since electron, or since, um, pro the, since atoms are electrically neutral, the number of protons must equal the number of electrons. They have to always be the same. Otherwise, the atom would have a charge, which does happen on occasion, okay? But most of the time, a normal atom, the electrons and the protons are equal. How do I figure out the number of neutrons? A little trick. Probably going to want to write it down. Okay, number of neutrons equals the atomic mass, which I'll show you on the periodic table here in a minute, minus the atomic number. Alright, so if we're looking at a periodic table, okay, the atomic mass is the number that's got the decimal points after it. Okay, so if we're, if we're looking at lithium, its atomic mass is 6.941. Okay, its atomic number is 3. All right, so if I want to figure out the number of neutrons in a typical lithium atom, I'm going to go 6.941 minus 3. So I'm going to get 3.941. Do you think you can have 0.941 neutrons? So it's most likely actually how many? Four. Yeah. You always round up. Okay. In this, when you do this operation, you always round up. Okay. So you're going to get okay that there are four neutrons in that one. Okay. If you look at hydrogen, on the other hand, okay, hydrogen's atomic number is 1.01. 1 .01. Okay. Minus its atomic number, one. How many neutrons does hydrogen have? I think that comes out to zero, doesn't it? Pretty much. Okay. So it doesn't have any. Okay. A hydrogen atom has no neutrons. Because okay. that comes out to essentially zero. Everyone all right with that? Making sense? Okay. okay. So, uh, I would say you probably need to know how to do that. Okay, how to calculate the number of neutrons. Because I know last semester, okay, on my chemistry unit exam, I asked the students to draw a picture of an atom of, I can't remember what it was. Say it was magnesium. I don't remember exactly, I don't remember which atom. Okay, but in order to draw that picture, do you need to know how many protons, neutrons, and electrons there are? Okay, so that's why I'm showing you here. Okay, number of protons is the atomic number. Number of electrons is the atomic number. Okay, they're always the same. Number of neutrons, atomic mass minus atomic number. All right. All right. So, like it says here, guys, please make sure you answer in complete sentences because, okay, I would say the answers to these questions would be your kind of summary of what we went over today 
you might want to use that when you're studying for let's say a quiz that could possibly come up on this stuff possibly tomorrow Okay, so while you're finishing up those questions here, guys, um, tomorrow we're going to be uh, starting our Google Classroom orientation and everything. We'll have the Chromebooks, and you can all get signed in and joined up and all that kind of stuff. But since that's not up and running yet, okay, your quiz tomorrow is on my website, okay, and it is right here. All right, it's Chemistry Quiz 01, The Atom. All right, so you'll need to go to my website tonight to look up that quiz, because right? it won't be posted on Google Classroom because no one's joined there yet, okay? or very few had on Friday. All right, so um, it's under the chemistry folder. Okay, so if you're, um, if you're going to my website, whoa. All right, so if you're going to my website, okay, uh, you're going to go into Unit 1 Chemistry, okay, and then just scroll down. Okay, a little ways here, and you'll see Chemistry Quiz 01, The Atom. Right, That's the one you want to look at tonight. Won't take you very long, I don't think. It's on pretty much the same thing as the questions you're working on right now. Right, So that you can come back tomorrow and get 100% on that one, because really, if you sit down and do that quiz tonight, there's no way you won't get 100% tomorrow. Okay? <coughs>